Normally we'd say that 20 minutes isn't enough for chronic kidney disease. Um, however, it probably is. Um, so... <laughs> um, the good news is that around Auckland, um, the people who need to be screened are getting screened, more than 95%. And as far as I can tell from all the referrals, everybody seems to know what to do with chronic kidney disease. Um, so questions? <laughs> Um, so this is some relatively fine-tuning points, certainly in terms of the numbers I see, but the sort of things that I was told might be helpful by some GPs and the things, the odd thing I notice on referrals. So I thought we'd quickly talk about the urinary sediment and urine microscopy when it came to investigations. For referrals, I thought a little mention about progressive chronic kidney disease in the elderly. Um, and also, probably the important one of the 20 minutes is about transient changes in creatinine and how you react to those in people with CKD. Um, and then a few things which might be useful in the management of patients with CKD, uh, particularly some a discussion about metformin, blood pressure control, and I was told that hyperkalemia is a pain for you guys when you get called from the lab. Um, so we would like a urine microscopy on all referrals, um, which is a, and it's a test which seems to get forgotten sometimes. Just to stress that it's, you shouldn't just think of urine microscopy as a, um, a thing to do for renal patients. It's also a very good test for the not right patient or the diagnostic quandary, the constitutional symptom. Um, we do pick up autoimmune disease, glomerulonephritis, in a, and it's a very non-specific test. So when you're struggling, it's a very simple test to do, to do a urine microscopy, and when you're referring to us, it would be appreciated. Um, when we're talking about an active urinary sediment, what we're looking for as nephrologists is really hematuria, red cells in the urine, um, with a special mention of casts and proteinuria. And just to remind everybody about the difference between glomerular hematuria and non-glomerular, um, if you have red cell casts, it means that the, casts are, the red cells have come from the glomerulus, they've gone through the tubule, they've been squashed together like toothpaste out of a, tu a tube of toothpaste, and you know that's diagnostic of glomerulonephritis. So if you've got red cell casts, just get on the phone uh, and we'll be d delighted to hear from you. Um, as the red cells go through the tubules, they get damaged. So if there's a high proportion of dysmorphic red cells on the report, that's also suggestive that you need to speak to a nephrologist. And of course, the barrier for protein is the glomerular basement membrane. So if there's trouble going on in that location, you're going to expect to see proteinuria as well. So blood plus protein is generally speaking uh, something that we're interested in. Um, just two caveats. Um, traditionally, diabetes wasn't supposed to cause blood in the urine, but nobody told Auckland that. Um, and a lot of our, about half of our diabetics do because it's so bad. Um, and obviously, if you have something very common like hypertension, which gives you a gram or so of protein, um, that can be combined with a non glomerular cause of hematuria, which messes up the situation a bit. Um, the non-glomerular hematuria obviously goes to the urologists uh, and we sometimes flick referrals through to our urology colleagues um, and the general rule is if it's just blood and the patient is over 30, um, it should go to urology first. Less than 30 and those um, diagnoses are so rare that we will probably see them anyway. Oh, thank you. Um, some referral things. So these are the criteria um, on, um, th that you have access to. Uh, but just to, this is another document which talks, which is very similar, talking about when to refer for progressive CKD. Um, and as I say, this all seems to be embedded. Um, essentially, if you're, e if you're diabetic and your EGFR is less than 45, if you're not diabetic, EGFR less than 30, and any proteinuria of more than a gram, so that's an ACR of 70 or a PCR of 100, is also a referral. But of course, there are some exclusions. And I do get some referrals that all, almost sound a bit apologetic, um, saying they've hit these criteria, so I'm sending them through, but they seem pretty good. Um, and I thought that might be something worth talking about. 
And this is classically an older patient who seems to be well managed, is taking their tablets, and they've now crossed over into referral territory. And I get the impression that sometimes people are quite sort of instinctively wondering why they're referring them to us. And the message is, don't feel you have to. <laughs> um, so as people get older, you lose a mill of GFR each year. Um, the, the equations don't work so well in old people. Um, but the other thing that you can do, which will take all of that into account, is that we now have kidney risk calculator scores. So you can just put in a Google search. The easy URL to remember is kidneyfailurerisk.com. Um, and if you go to that, it's really simple. I'm hoping to get the lab test to put this into their reports one day. Everything's there on the lab test. You only need an age, a gender, a region, which will be non-North America. There's North America and the rest of the world. The GFR, your albumin creatinine ratio, which is SI units, which you select, and then you calculate. And you get a two or five year risk of end stage renal disease. We get, you get both. Um, and if you think that someone's 75 and frail with other comorbidities and they've only got a one in five chance of being in end stage five years from now, you might want to hold fire. This is probably the most important one, the thing I see that does concern me the most, which is the response to transient changes in creatinine. Um, and this is particularly in the context of cardiorenal syndrome. Cardiorenal syndrome is a relatively new kid on the block. People classify it into five different types, uh, I think to get a publication more than anything else. Um, but in practice, all it really is, is if somebody has chronic kidney disease and heart issues, especially if they're on these medications, uh, which obviously have a lot of interaction, diuretics, spironolactone, ACE, ARB, and especially those severe heart failure patients, the sort of patients who the uptitration clinic you know, keep walking around, get them to walk around with systolics of 80, 90, 102. These are the people who have got risks of changes in their creatinine. And I do sometimes see people like this on these medications with very good blood pressure control, suddenly taking a turn for the worse and being referred through as a progressive CKD and things have just progressed a bit. Um, now, in a sense, that's not a necessary referral because what we're going to do is probably tell them to withhold their fruzamide, drink up a bit, or pull back on their ACE inhibitor because their blood pressure's too low. So it's not really nephrological, but also it's not actually adequate if someone's going off quite quickly to send for a routine outpatient appointment. Um, because really, what you need to be doing is rechecking in a week and making a change because things can happen to the kidney quite quickly. Um, and the things to be aware of is obviously using weight, and this is a good thing for patient education, giving a goal weight to patients so they can monitor their fluid status, <laughs> educating them about <laughs> assessing the, the degree of swelling in their ankles, and lying and standing blood pressure. You know, quite it's quite surprising the number of times you think a patient looks reasonably well filled and reasonably hydrated, and then you get them to stand up and their blood pressure drops to 80 or 70. Um, so just to make that distinction, um, don't assume, it's this, it's this question, am I looking at progressive chronic kidney disease or am I looking at acute on chronic? And if it's acute on chronic, then it has to be dealt with more acutely. Um, so I do see that sometimes. A minor point which throws up a bit of confusion um, for those who've you know, forgotten the zebras from medical school, um, trimethoprim interferes with your creatinine secretion. So we have had a few referrals for worsening CKD when a patient's on um, trimethoprim or long-term trimethoprim. Um, it doesn't affect the urea, won't affect your uric acid. Um, so just to be aware of that. It, creatinine can go up from 140 to 180 in an older person because of trimethoprim. I've seen, I've seen that sort of degree of change. Just a few um, little bullet points about management. Um, metformin. So for years and years and years, we've been telling you to be cautious about metformin. And you have to stop metformin when the EGFR is 30. So we'd now like to say sorry about that. 
um, it turns out um, that you can carry on metformin down to 15 is now the official guideline. Um, and there's some the important thing is to reduce the dose. So there's some, go there's some dose guiding here, some dose guidance. Um, but actually, metformin has a very wide therapeutic window. Nobody knows quite what it is because nobody knows what the toxic level is. Um, but we know from experience that if you have someone on three grams a day and their EGFR is 30, they're usually absolutely fine. So if somebody does drop to below 30 um, and you half the dose to 1.5, you know, they're still fine. Um, or, you, or you can just use those guidelines. Um, I've done some research on metformin, and that's part of why this has changed. We're going to have metformin assays available around Auckland soon, so you might see those results, and that will hopefully, and that will have that little bit of information about how to interpret metformin assays. So that will hopefully sort of embed this. Um, and over time, the next thing I'm going to do is sort of extend even further. So at some point, people will probably just be staying on metformin, even onto dialysis, just at a lower dose. So just to be aware of that, and if, we, and if you see patients with a low GFR and metformin, it doesn't necessarily mean that we've had a brain fade. Obviously, with um, metformin patients, and this is true of the cardiorenal patients as well, you have to warn patients about what to do if they're unstable and if they're going to have that acute on chronic kidney injury. So actually, a lot of what I do in my clinic is I educate patients about acute kidney injury. Because a lot of our patients, if they're going to end up in renal trouble, it's actually not from progression, it's from their comorbidities, and it's during an admission, or it will result in an admission. Um, and I think, again, when I was at medical school, this was just sort of missed out somehow. We don't tell people just to look at what they're passing and to be wary of how much urine they're passing, and that passing a small volume of dark urine is a bad sign. Um, warning them that if they have a GI upset or there's food poisoning going around, the, going around the house that they need to have a low threshold for seeing somebody um, and having their ACE inhibitor withdrawn. Basically that any condition with a fever they need to be a little bit cautious. Um, so that's true for anybody on metformin but it's also true for those um, CKD, pa those um, cardiorenal patients that we're seeing more and more commonly now. Uh, so that's an important message for the patients. Um, a quick mention about blood pressure control. Um, just to say that blood pressure control um, eats everything else for breakfast when it comes to chronic kidney disease. Probably for most other things as well, actually. Um, but in terms of reducing risk for your patients, you can forget about the rest. That's the low value stuff that we get paid to do in clinic. Um, the important thing is blood pressure control, and I've got to say that I, I normally see that that's done very well. Um, the time this is useful, I think, is when you have the struggling patient who's really struggling with adherence, and I have had some success in acknowledging that it's hard to take 10 tablets a day, uh, but if they can focus on one tablet, um, your inner base or your inner base plus, then you'll really get 90% of the benefits of what we're doing for you. Um, and giving the patient the opportunity to just focus on one tablet a day and building from there um, sometimes is a nice way of trying to get them back on an even keel uh, and protect their kidneys and their heart. Sort of doing Okay, not bad for time. And finally, hyperkalemia. Um, so I was told by a group of GPs that they... Um, hate getting phone calls from the lab about potassium and not knowing what to do with potassium and what level. Um, there was a discussion amongst national nephrology as to whether we could give you guys a strict level, and the answer was we couldn't. We couldn't agree. <laughs> um, so I'll give you mine. Um, in general, if a potassium is greater than 6.5, you need to react to that. Um, and if that's outside of normal hours, they probably need to go to the emergency department just to get checked up. Um, 5.5 to 6.5. Well, if it's over 6, um, I don't think they necessarily need to be woken up in the middle of the night, but they need to get an ECG 
at some time, you know, the next day, or be sent, um, ask them to come back for an ECG to check for the signs of hyperkalemia, check that they're not bradycardic. But of course, the first thing as well is you'll just repeat the blood test. Mm. You'll ask about hemolysis. So uh, that's the very first thing at the top. Make sure it's not a hemolyzed sample, but you'll repeat the blood test to see if the problem goes away. And then in terms of management, if you've got somebody who's tracking along at high potassium levels, um, there's a few things that you can do and a few ways to respond to that. Obviously, the first thing we tend to do is look at the medications. Um, so the classics are ACE, ARB, and spironolactone, and there are some ra more rarely used potassium-sparing diuretics. Um, so you reduce those or take them off. It's, wor it's worth talking to people about their diet. Um, I'm convinced that chronic kidney disease gives people a taste for bananas. Um, <laughs> it's true, you go around to Ward 1 and every patient has bananas brought in for them. <laughs> uh, there is no other fruit on Ward 1. Um, and there are dietary sheets available to educate patients about that. It's worth thinking about serum bicarbonate. So diabetics, it's quite common to have a type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Um, and giving people sodium bicarbonate will sort out their potassium issues or will, will significantly help. Um, just be aware of calcium. Um, potassium and calcium do the opposite things when it comes to the heart. So if you're worried that the potassium is a bit on the high side and what you want to do and you notice that calcium is only two, um, then you probably need to be a bit more worried than if their calcium is 2.5. If you've done those things and people are still struggling and you're still in that, you know, over normal range of potassium, then you really need to be speaking to us anyway. Um, we can give calcium rosonium with lactulose. It's a pretty miserable long-term drug um, and patients will struggle to take it. Um, so you need to be speaking to us anyway. But those are the simpler things that you can do which uh, might sort out the problem for you and reduce the number of calls from the lab. And with two minutes to go, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Christopher, for spending your time with us.